This program was made possible in part by the following underwriters. The D-Day Museum Pacific Theater opening television program is underwritten in part by Texaco. We salute our Louisiana veterans for their heroism and dedication to this country's freedom. Texaco is a proud supporter of public television. Good evening, I'm Bob Courtney. The tragic events of September 11th have made every American value the meaning of freedom and democracy in this great country. This date will live in our memories, cast in the consciousness of this generation with the same sense of terror, fear, and determination created by the last horrific attack on what has been called our greatest generation. December 7, 1941, the attack on Pearl Harbor is a day that will live in infamy. And the years 1941 through 1945 showed us all what it took to patiently and courageously fight to preserve freedom. Tonight, we intend to share with you the stories of those who have fought in that war and the building of a museum to honor their efforts. Although this program was in the planning stages for months, we think it is now more poignant and appropriate than ever. How these heroes coped both at home and abroad can be a lesson for all generations. The dream was born in the middle of a nightmare. The sacrifice of thousands for the benefit of millions. A generation of Americans gave of themselves to protect a cherished way of life and asked for nothing in return. But a generation later, the country they fought for found a way to say, thank you. Whereas the United States is the only allied nation which does not have an active museum to honor the veterans of World War II and the amphibious D-Day invasions, and whereas it is the express wish of the citizens of this great state of Louisiana to publicly honor and praise the brave, selfless patriots who have made our freedom possible. Therefore, I do hereby declare the opening of the National D-Day Museum in New Orleans, Louisiana, on June the 6th, 2000, as a day of remembrance and proclaim the week of June the 6th, 2000 as National D-Day Museum Week. The National D-Day Museum opened in New Orleans to a fanfare worthy of the generation it was built to honor. It opened with a grandeur nearly as epic as the battles that turned the tide of World War II. But as much as that long ago epic was a lament, this one, was a song, and joining the chorus were those who have taken it upon themselves to chronicle the trials and triumphs of this great generation. Here in this great city, the great state of Louisiana, it's a rare privilege for me to be with so many members of the greatest generation. It's an honor to uh, be with all of you today. It's an honor and a privilege for me to be here as part of uh, an event where the veterans of the Second World War and the city of New Orleans are making history right now. The victory they fought for was a long time ago, and time takes its toll. Many of those who survived the fields of battle did not live to see this day, but thankfully many did. And while this was a birthday celebration for the museum, the guests of honor were those who made it possible. But the real dignitaries, they're sitting right in front of me and they're scattered all through this audience. The men and women of the Second World War and what they've done for us. Now, 56 years ago on this day, the word began to spread across the United States as the sun rose in New York and finally got out to San Francisco, that this was it. D-Day was here. Every family in America had a son, or a husband, or a brother, or an uncle, or a neighbor who was in England. New Orleans and the world said thank you with a salute to the past and a prayer for the future. And welcome once again. We have a wonderful evening planned for you this evening. 
going to be talking about the National D-Day Museum and a new exhibit that is opening there, a new wing. Uh, and uh, we've got a lot of folks who are going to be bringing in to talk about both the museum and to talk about uh, the greatest generation and uh, the war effort and, uh, and the war in the Pacific. Uh, we're going to ask you as our viewers to get involved because a part of the purpose of this program is to seek out people who, uh, who participated, uh, who have stories to tell, veterans uh, and, uh, and people who were involved in the war efforts, specifically, uh, especially in the uh, Pacific Theater, but not limited to that, anyone who had a role uh, during World War II. We've got a, a panel of uh, volunteers who are in the studio with us this evening that are going to be taking phone calls, and we have some numbers on the screen, so uh, if you would like to learn more and if you would like to call us and, and uh, let us know who you are so that we can contact you and get you involved in this great event, you can call the number on your screen. Screen, and that number is 1-800-959-8363. And if you're calling from the Baton Rouge area, it's 767-4234. Uh, let's kick things off. We have a, a panel of experts uh, to join us here in the first uh, segment of our program, and I'd like to welcome them. Uh, first of all, Hugh Ambrose, who is a, a research historian and uh, happens to uh, have a pretty good boss. He works for his father, Dr. Stephen Ambrose. We're glad to have you here. The chairman of the National D Day Museum Board, uh, Boise Bollinger. Uh, Boise, it's good to see you again. Thank and, you of are. course, the president, uh, Dr. Nick Mueller. Uh, great to have you all. We did uh, something like this, it seems like, only a few months ago, but it's actually been a little while, hasn't Almost it? Almost a year and a half. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, let's start with you, uh, Boise, since you are the chairman of this effort. Tell me a little bit about what this new wing is about in this exhibit. Well, obviously, it's to honor those D-Days of the Pacific, which was a much larger war. Uh, the immense uh, space it covered was tremendous, and, and the whole world was uh, was focused on the Pacific War after we uh, we finished the European War, but uh, Bob, it's really important to know too that Louisiana not only houses this wonderful national resource, but Louisiana supports it. So we really appreciate LPB doing this again because Louisianians primarily call into this program, let us know who they are, let us know of their interest in coming, and we want them to be there. Not only veterans, not only veterans' families. But Louisiana citizens who want to partake in our great opening of the Pacific Wing, which we'll talk about a lot more tonight. Dr. Mueller, the, the opening of the National D-Day Museum was, as we saw from the pictures, was quite an event. Uh, uh, maybe in, in some respects bigger than some of us even expected. It was quite a success, wasn't it? It was an extraordinary success, and as Boise has indicated, uh, due in large measure to the wonderful support of uh, Louisianans who came and supported it. Uh, there were 200,000 people on the street for that parade, and we're projecting a parade uh, just like that again this year even more important, I think, with our nation under attack, that we uh, step forward and, uh, and show the world what the greatest generation was like and what this generation is also like in terms of our response to the threats from abroad. So, interestingly, uh, three months almost after September 11, we're going to honor uh, the opening of our uh, Pacific Wing uh, with the same three days of festivities uh, that took place when we opened the museum. It's going to be extraordinary. We want Louisiana veterans to, to come. There's going to be opportunities to ride in the parade. There's going to be a Gathering of Eagles event uh, for veterans in the convention center, uh, USO dance. Uh, so we want people to call in today. We're going to send you all the information, the registration packets, uh, so that you can get hotels and get into these events. It's going to be uh, quite a celebration. I remember when we did this program before, we had a lot of people who called us and said, hey, what about the Pacific? You know, and so, and we told them it's coming and now here, it's going to be it here is. starting on December 7th. Absolutely. It's going to be quite an event. Uh, Hugh, you're, this, this whole thing, of course, is, is uh, your, your father has been a, a tremendous uh, uh, driving force behind all of That's this. Right. And it must be exciting to, to work in this and, and see all of this realized. That's right. I was lucky enough to, uh, to grow up with a, with a man who understood that uh, World War II was the defining moment of the 20th century. And to, as he did his research, get to meet some of those veterans uh, that, uh, that are calling in right now um, and learn the stories and learn what it took um, to create this, this wonderful peace and prosperity that we've enjoyed up until just a week ago. Um, and it, for my father, the last grand opening was such a, a wonderful event, I think mostly because the people of Louisiana came up to him and said, thank you so much 
for getting the world to come and see Louisiana for something other than Mardi Gras or Jazz Fest, which are wonderful events. But the South and Louisiana has so much more depth, and we're really proud to have this museum here. And so it's uh, my great privilege to be a part of, of, of this effort. It is interesting that we've said there were a lot of D-Days in the Pacific. That, I mean, that, it was all about D-Days. It was island hopping, as it's been called, going from one island to another, landings and, and battles, right? That's right. Yeah. Yeah, it's been, uh, we've reckoned about 129 different D-Days during the course wow. of the war in the Pacific which was um, uh, the, the, the effort that it takes, not only the guys on the front lines, but the, the millions of people uh, uh, working here in Louisiana and all across the country uh, to, to push that, uh, that anvil across uh, the Pacific Rim is a, is a, was one of our great uh, feats. Well, this event, of course, I, I think we said the date, it, it's December 7th. 8th and 9th, the three days, and of course uh, on the date, uh, the anniversary date of Pearl Harbor, and then three days of events all together uh, to open up this wing. That's correct. Well, we've talked about the wing. Maybe we ought to see what we're talking about. We have a little piece that uh, we put together. Byron Henderson uh, has uh, put together these packages. We want to thank Byron for doing that. Let's take a look at the new wing. An army of men goes to work with a big job to do. They're not fighting a war, but they're working to honor another army who did in another time, another world. Just yards away from the exhibit halls of the National D-Day Museum in New Orleans, preparations are underway for an expansion. Today, you can walk through this museum and see the history of the men and women who have become known as the greatest generation. They're the fighting men, the volunteers, the nurses, the construction workers, and the people who kept the home fires burning during the dark days of World War II. But so far, the museum has focused primarily on the war in Europe. Soon, on the anniversary of the attack at Pearl Harbor, the National D-Day Museum begins to tell the rest of the story the story of the war in the Pacific. My dad served in the Pacific Arena in the Signal Corps, and he went on to the islands, uh, you know, setting up communications before General MacArthur would land. So uh, we feel very fortunate that he came back from the Pacific Arena or I wouldn't be here. <laughs> Nora Hillier and her family drove to New Orleans from past Christiane, Mississippi for their first visit to the D-Day Museum. I think it's wonderful, and I think it's about time our World War II veterans were honored. First of all, I hope they take with them um, an understanding of the basic historical events that occurred in the Pacific between 1941 and 1945. Paula Ussery is curator of collections for the D-Day Museum's Pacific exhibit. And along with an understanding of the history of the war in the Pacific, she also wants visitors to appreciate the human dimension as well. The fighting in the Pacific um, has as one of its hallmarks um, a savagery that is not generally found uh, when talking about the European battles. In order to personalize what is a subject that has just uh, enormous mind-boggling statistics attached to it, what we do here is to take an individual soldier, sailor, marine, nurse, and tell their unique story about what it was like to be in Europe or in the Pacific. The exhibit does this with genuine articles, personal mementos from that horrible conflict, many donated by the veterans themselves. For example, this remarkably well-preserved clock from a merchant marine ship. One of the um, uh, very much unsung uh, heroes of the supply effort in World War II is, of course, the American merchant fleet and the um, chronometer and the short snorter um, are two of the items that have been donated to us by a merchant captain uh, who sailed the Pacific Seas. When the exhibit opens, you'll also be able to see these vintage swords issued to Japanese army officers, confiscated and carried home by American sailors. This cheaply made gun, known as a last-ditch rifle, manufactured and issued to Japanese civilians as fear grew of an American invasion, and this artifact, the actual plane flown by a Pacific Theater veteran, is already hanging in the lobby. 
Thomas Lupo shot down several enemy planes during the war and is one of the founders of the National D-Day Museum. He says it's important for people to realize D-Day was not just the famous landing on Omaha Beach. That is a misconception. Every invasion had a day of the attack, the initial attack, that was D-Day. And there were so many more D-Days in the Pacific than the Atlantic. Not only that, in the D-Day in Normandy, they leave out the D-Day in Africa. And we will also, when we get the other buildings around here that we're working on, we will cover that aspect of the uh, citizen army's participation. Just a very, very brief preview of what you're going to get to see when this new wing opens on December 7th. And, of course, we can't show it all. There's some things here that have been brought down that are in the studio, so, some of the artifacts. Uh, the, each piece uh, uh, has its own story to tell. And if you have your own story to tell, if you're a veteran and if you've participated in the uh, Pacific Theater during World War II, we'd like to hear from you tonight. You can call that 800 number uh, that we've had on the screen, and uh, it's 1-800-959-8363, or if you're calling in the Baton Rouge area, it's 767-4234. And let us hear from you. Um, we are joined now in our panel by the woman you just met in the uh, in Byron's uh, piece by the magic of television. We can now transport her here from the museum, <laughs> Paula, Paula Ussery. Uh, Paula, you are cu curator of collections. Yes, sir. This must be a, uh, an exciting and interesting job, although a difficult one, to find these things and actually get to bring them in and learn the stories about them. Um, every day, uh, or at least every other day, is very much like Christmas. Um, you never know when the phone rings or when you open your mail at the end of a day um, what uh, object and story is going to suddenly appear in your life. And um, uh, our world uh, in collections is filled with surprises. Um, and some of the stories that emerged, um, as our visitors will see in December, uh, from Pacific veterans and or their families are truly phenomenal. And, uh, and I think will be every inch as strong as the stories we've presented um, from the European theater veterans. Nick, I mean, war is, is difficult. World War II was, was, was a very difficult thing for all of the world, and, and uh, we weren't really ready for it when it happened. But I've often heard that the, the Pacific theater was a little more savage than the war in Europe. Is that a correct Yes, uh, that's uh, often remarked, and it's true. And we're going to uh, tell that uh, part of the story uh, in the Pacific wing of the National D-Day Museum. The brutality of the war was different. You had the kamikaze uh, uh, pilots for the first time and uh, the suicide attacks and that's uh, particularly relevant uh, in terms of what happened last week and uh, the the cultural differences between the Asian and uh, and the Western cultures uh, is also relevant in, in in the context of today but we're going to look at that uh, the, uh, the the whole war was uh, was very difficult uh, from Americans. I mean, medics were being shot. Uh, that didn't happen in, in Europe. So we, in Europe at least, we're fighting another Western Christian culture. Here we had to learn to adjust to a different cultural orientation. And we're going to tell those stories. The race issue is, is an issue that needs to be looked at in, in the Pacific. And uh, so it is different. The exhibits are going to be uh, very pr uh, provoking and extremely exciting. This is a uh this is one more piece of the entire puzzle or, or the entire presentation of the National D-Day Museum. Yes, it is. And, uh, of course, we're, we're still building, and we want all of Louisiana to help build it uh, with us. Last time and this time, we want to also invite people to participate by our Pave the Road to Victory campaign. And uh, opportunities, if you call in tonight, uh, we'll send you information on uh, purchasing bricks. Uh, in the museum or around, outside the museum, and uh, we'll tell you more about that at the end. Uh, we also, as you mentioned, oral histories, and I might just hold this up, but uh, if uh, someone uh, wants to give their oral history, uh, veterans who might want to tell their story, we'll either collect them at the University of New Orleans at the Eisenhower Center, uh, the D-Day Museum itself, 
and even personal documentaries uh, can be arranged uh, through the museum. So we have a lot of exciting ways for veterans and Louisianans to be involved with us in a very direct and tangible way, and also that we will be preserving their history through these stories. Now, Hugh, I understand your father's working on a book on the Pacific Theater? That's right. We began about a, about a year ago to begin uh, a book on the Pacific. We originally thought it might be entitled Citizen Soldiers of the Pacific because the success that we had uh, on Citizen Soldiers, the book that he wrote about the ETO, was dramatic. Um, but, of course, the Marines would never go uh, for that title, so we're going to come up with a different title. But at the same time, it gets back to his idea of putting the guys, the men and women, uh, who were in the front lines are going to tell the story as much as possible. And so the oral histories and the artifacts and the letters that we get tonight are going to be a part of that effort. Right, and we're going to be doing a little bit of that a little bit later in the program. We've got some veterans here in the studios who are going to be joining us a little later on and sharing their stories so you'll get a little bit more of a feel for what this is all about. Right now, what we'd like to do is uh, we'd like to go back to videotape because... Uh, one of the things that a lot of people in, in our generation, later generations, don't realize is that, in a, in a sense, World War II actually began in the Pacific Theater and began in that area of the world rather than in Europe in many ways, because Ameri at least for Americans, because Americans were actually fighting in China long before Pearl Harbor. And let's take a look at uh, what was going on there right now. Even before America entered World War II, many of her military men joined the fight against Japanese invaders. But their targets were not the fighter planes and bombers that destroyed American ships and killed 2,400 people at Pearl Harbor. Some of the first American shots in the war were fired in the skies over China. Flying Tigers were an American volunteer group of Americans who volunteered to serve with General uh, Chenault in China. U.S. Army General Claire Chenault, a Louisiana native, was under contract to the Chinese government in the days before the attack at Pearl Harbor drew America into the war. Chenault led a band of former American aviators who had resigned their commissions to fight in China as soldiers of fortune. Baton Rouge's USS Kidd Museum has several exhibits dedicated to the Flying Tigers. Mari Drummond is the museum's director. The country was basically overrun by the Japanese uh, prior to America's in involvement uh, or a declaration of war against Japan. Uh, but they had a lot to do to stem, not so much to stem the tide, but to protect as many roads and bridges and escape routes and things like that for refugees and things of that nature. The Flying Tigers, Fei Hu in Chinese, drew a line in the sky between the invading Japanese and the grateful Chinese government and its citizens. These men who flew these aircraft uh, were so talented and so courageous. Because of their involvement, uh, they saved millions of people's lives uh, just because of the uh, support that they gave uh, Shane Kai-shek. One of the exhibits here is a replica of a Flying Tigers fighter. The original was piloted by a Louisiana native named Wiltz Segura. Nicknamed Flash by his fellow aviators, Segura named his plane after his then fiance Joy. Now a widow, Joy Segura still lives in the New Iberia home where she and her husband settled after he came home from the war. Well, he enjoyed every minute that he was over there. It was, you know, a new experience to him. And uh, it's a part of his life that uh, he never forgot. She says Segura didn't tell her about the risks he faced in the skies over China until it was all over. Still, she says she worried every minute he was there. He was shot down twice behind enemy lines, but walked back each time. One time they carried him over the mountains, maybe in a sedan chair because his legs were injured. And uh, all of that was a very unusual experience. Segura went to China in 1942, after America had entered the war and the Flying Tigers became a regular squadron of the Army Air Corps. And uh, of course then General Chenault was still there and he was their overall commander in chief. General Chenault and all the men who flew uh, with the Flying Tigers were heroes in China. Uh, many years later, some 20, 20 some odd years ago, uh, the uh, Republic of Taiwan uh, donated this statue you see behind us here uh, to the uh, state of Louisiana uh, of General Chenault, a bronze statue of the general, uh, 
uh, in their, for their appreciation for what, would, what the general did and all the men who flew for him. All right. Uh, the, the story is about the Pacific Theater, and that's what we're here to talk about tonight, the opening of the new wing of the National D-Day Museum, and that will take place on December 7th, 8th, and 9th. It's coming up. And uh, if you are a veteran and uh, you have uh, a story to tell us, we would like to hear it. Our phone lines are open. We're looking for you. Why not give us a call right now at 1-800-959-8363? Or if you're calling from the Baton Rouge area, 767-4234. And we're just, uh, we're moving people in and out here, folks. And we've, we've been joined by another very distinguished panel of, uh, of folks here to talk uh, about this opening and to talk about uh, World War II. And uh, right now we're going to focus, uh, as we did in the package, a little bit on the, uh, the war in China and uh, America's involvement there. And we have some, uh, some folks joining us now. First, uh, Marty Morgan, who is the uh, research, uh, rehears, research historian with the National D-Day Museum. Marty, welcome. Uh, next to Marty is another Morgan. You guys are not related, I'm, I'm told, but you look alike. Uh, <laughs> Woodrow Wilson Morgan, who uh, was in the United States uh, Army Air Force. And, uh, and uh, next to him is uh, Dr. Leonard Burns, who was a Marine. Yep. And uh, also on the end there is Burl Wheeler who was in the United States Army Air Force as well. No? Engineers. Engineer. Okay. Mm -hmm. And uh, I want to thank all of you for being here. Let's start with our academic on the panel right now. <laughs> uh, what is the, what is the, the purpose, uh, uh, what is the focus, I mean, on, on the war in China and the, this precursor and, and how this continued during World War II? Well, the museum currently does not feature the war in China. Um, we have plans, long-range plans, to uh, put together an exhibit dealing with the China-Burma-India theater which is usually referred to as the CBI. And the significance of, of that is, of course, enormous. Um, World War II, on the Asian side of it, began as early as 1931. In fact, the United States, the first combat casualties in the United States military during the Second World War, technically, occurred in December of 1937 when the US, uh, USS Panay, an American gunboat, was attacked and sunk on the Yangtze River by Japanese forces. So the United States uh, begins seeing losses as early as 1937, carrying all the way to the very bitter end in 19. 45. So the United the, the National D-Day Museum is interested, of course, in interpreting that significant part of the history and the history that these three gentlemen represent. All right, and 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 before World War II, we had uh, we had pilots who were actually resigning their commissions and going and and working in the private sector uh, and fighting in the war, correct? That, that's correct. Yeah. The American Volunteer Group, yeah. the AVGs, they earned a nickname because of the what they painted on the sides of their P-40s. They painted tiger's teeth and they were nicknamed right. the Flying Tigers and um, right. Flying Tigers can actually trace their lineage back to the state of Louisiana to Claire Chenault. But right. there were a number of pilots of notoriety, I would mention Pappy Boeington, for example, right. who served in the AVG before the war. And I would point out also that Woodrow Wilson Morgan here was a ground crewman for the AVG. Now, Mr. Morgan, tell us a little bit about uh, where you were and uh, what you were doing. I left uh, after completing your training in the United States. I left um, San Francisco in the USAT Brazil and sailed for 43 days, a nice cruise, and landed in Bombay, India, and, and went across India by train and wound up in on the Brahmaputra River Valley at uh, a Dinjan Air Base. And we spent a year there at Dinjan. Uh, and I was in charge of the engine change crew. We had P-51 aircraft, which was alleged, most of the pilots tell me, was the best fighter plane we had during World War II. And then after completing the gear there, we flew over the hump, not completely over the Himalayan, but through a passageway. You, the, the planes we went over on transports couldn't go over the, completely over the hump. They flew a passage around between 17, 8, and 18,000 feet. And we flew up. Uh, five and a half hour flight from Chabwa, India to Chintu, China. And this was a base where the B-29s were based. It was, uh, they had six bases in this valley and three were fighter bases and one of our outfit, the 529th Fighter Squadron, which I was involved with, in the 311th group, uh, was at A-6 at Punchichon. You couldn't have you couldn't have been any further from home, could you? Not hardly, no. no. no I mean, indeed. you were a long, long, long way ways. away. That's right. Yes, what indeed. did that feel like? Well, it uh, it gives you some anxious moments sometimes, and you you really miss your the folks who 
especially if you were a home yeah. homebody like I was. You know, I hadn't been away from home too much, and so we missed we missed our folks a lot. Got to do a lot of traveling. Right, and then after the Chintu Valley, we went on up to Sion, which was the farthest north base we had, and and I. Um, uh, there, I was just doing the, the aircraft maintenance, you know, taking care of them. But it, the, the one thing I want to say, it was a real pleasure uh, working in China under a, a gentleman like Cly General Cairo Chenault, who was the greatest fighter pilot that, that ever existed, in my opinion. He and he, I mean, the tactician he was. He trained his people where they they wound up with a result of of ten ten losses for every one we lost, yeah. you know, in Japanese. So. He thinned them out in a hurry, and the, the Chinese are the one named these people, the flying tigers. They're Fin Hu. That's the right. flying tiger in Chinese. When when they see saw how bad they were tearing up the Japanese. Yeah, let's move on to uh, to Dr. Burns now. A am I correct? You were at Pearl Harbor as well. Well, well so Pearl your involvement started pretty early, huh? <laughs> <laughs> well, we were stationed at uh, Camp Lejeune, uh, North Carolina. Incidentally, they had started the attack uh, uh, by moving people to get rid of the conflict that exists today. And from Pearl Harbor, after military training there, um, I was assigned to cataloging all of the jeeps and the uh, equipment coming back from the World Wars and found body parts in different situations in the Pacific, which was really terrible. Mm -hmm. Then the conflict started in Iwo, and we were sent over to Iwo. After Iwo, then they sent us to occupation duty in Japan, and we were at Sasebo, Japan, an old submarine base. So the Marines had the whole Pacific covered. Yeah. Now, Mr. Wheeler, tell us a little bit about what you were doing during the war. Well, I'd like to put it in this context. The original mission of the China Burma India Theater was to prevent the surrender of China to the total capitulation of China to Japan. Not having any knowledge of the cataclysmic conclusion of World War II, the prospect that to defeat the enemy, we would have to mount a land-based campaign throughout China, which was too horrible to even contemplate at the time. So the essence of it was to supply China. Take supplies into China, keep them viable, keep them against, uh, standing up against the Japanese, so that was our original mission, but of course the mission expanded as we developed uh, <coughs> air bases in China. We took the battle all the way to Japan and to Indochina and the South uh, the China Seas. <coughs> For my part, I was in the engineers. The engineers constructed the uh, Lido Road, also known as the Stillwell Road or Pix Pike, it might have been called also. It was a road that uh, ran from Lido, Assam, India. 1,079 miles all the way into Kuming, China. And so it, it was not so easy to build roads in some of these places, was it? <laughs> Especially with the monsoon season. <laughs> Especially with the monsoon. The, our engineers would scrape out uh, roadways along the mountainside and the monsoon rains would come along and wash it all away. So I'd have to go back. Sort of know. like Louisiana? <laughs> 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 it, yeah, it rained a little bit more there than in, in Louisiana. Yeah, a little bit more. Mm -hmm. The weather forecast there was rain this month and next. <laughs> yeah. Now, you too, all of you were a long way from home. What was it like uh, being so far away from friends well, and family? Well, it wasn't just being a long way from home. The cultures that we encountered, the ethnic groups that we encountered were so different than any other group. In India, the Hindus, the Sikhs, the Gurkhas, the British, and uh, in Burma, the Nagas, the Naga Hillsmen, the Kachins, the Shans. It was so totally different than anything we were ever prepared for or anticipated that would ever participate in. One of the things I, I, I asked the last time, uh, certainly being so far away from home, being involved in a conflict of this nature with the uncertainty that existed, um, were you afraid? Oh, yes. <laughs> a lot of times, yes, sir. Yeah. Yes, sir. Uh, there was a great deal of fear on many, many occasions. Just think that you're entering a Japanese country where that's your enemy, and the word is out that the Marines are going to rape the women and kill the children. Well, you looked over each shoulder every step you took for fear that somebody might be after you. Yeah. And it was a fear until after a while they became aware that the 
the Americans were not to harm the children, not to harm the women, and they then began to uh, be a little more considerate. In the case of uh, World War II, heroism was awfully, uh, often explained by many people called heroes as simply doing their job. It was something that had to be done. And there were lots of heroes, uh, uh, from the foot soldier to the, to the pilots. And right now, we'd like to introduce you to one of our own heroes during World War II. In 1941, Jeff DeBlanc was a student at Southwestern Louisiana Institute, and America and its president, Franklin Roosevelt, were facing a world war. Franklin Roosevelt had a beautiful idea. He knew that aviation would be a factor as an arm of the uh, uh, services, a good tool to use. He uh, ran in what we call a CPT program, Civilian Pilot Training Program, and he put it in the colleges. Well, many of us, as a matter of fact, the services quickly took our aviators, I'd say 80% of the aviators, from CPT flight training. As I went into the Marine Corps at uh, North Island in uh, San Diego, California, but I find out, found out very quickly <laughs> that the Marine Corps is a fast-moving outfit. I had no idea. I figured, well, here I received my wings in 1942, early 1942, and I could see myself with a convertible out on the beaches and having a good time with wings, et cetera, et cetera, but <laughs> not with the Marine Corps. As soon as I got into North Island, they, I managed to get about nine hours in the fighter plane I was going to use to fight the Japanese and was shipped overseas with VMF-112. We were called the Cactus Air Force. The planes that we had were all obsolete. The pilots that we had were New Zealanders, Australians, and American. Luckily, we had a Lieutenant Colonel, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Bowers. That man, I think, saved all of our lives. I will tell you how to fight the Japanese Zero. And he said, dogfight them. And we were told never dogfight them because they could outmaneuver us and they had more speed and everything else. He said, you're going to hit that Zero and you're going to blow him up into pieces and fly through him. And he was right. My first contact, by the time I had 10 hours in flying, I was on that big raid where the Japanese came in with twin Betty bombers, twin bombers with torpedoes to hit our fleet right off Guadalcanal. And this was my second combat tour. And I, I, I didn't have no order in about 10 hours and by the time of the whole thing. I, I, I dove with the idea through our own anti-aircraft fire. Our own anti-aircraft fire that was put up by the fleet off Guadalcanal knocked two of the guards off my right wing and left wing down, they survived the crash. I went through, and 50 feet off the waters, I burned two beds like that, two twin engine bombers to burn them up, but I swear I made my mistake. I figured right then and there, I figured, how did he? I'm ready to go home. So I looked at my watch, instead of looking for planes. Right when I looked at my watch at 1800 hours, six o'clock, a 20 millimeter or seven point down, came over my left shoulder and took the watch right off my wrist. They exploded in the instrument panel with a 20 millimeter fire that set it afire. So I bailed out at 2,000 feet. I uh, pulled the, I, I don't remember pulling the rip cord, but I knew I pulled it, in my anxiety, I pulled it too fast, and I'm in the middle of the dogfight. There's zeros all around. So I figured he was gonna let me have it, but I played dead like a possum, you know. I, 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 right when he, cir he circled me twice, and I just played as if I were dead, head down and everything else, just that kind. Of, and I watched him out the corner of my eye, and he took me and went back to Kahili. But I was so tired that uh, I slept in the, in the uh, brush. They sent uh, a squadron of P-30, not a squadron, but they sent 18 P-38s for high cover. And for the first time in my life, they sent, I saw a Corsair. And when I saw those gull wings, I knew we had it made. They were low cover in the P-38s for high cover, and they stopped, the P-boat landed, RT paddled me out, and they brought us to Guadalcanal safely. By the time I was, after the Okinawa campaign, I came back and got out of the service on you know, reserve status and got married to my high school sweetheart, you know, and that's the reason. When we got married, uh, 
I received a, a call from Washington that uh, I would go back on active duty to receive the Congressional Medal of Honor. I was very honored to receive this high award, very humble, really, because so many men have done more than I, and I knew of it, and they're dead. And welcome back. 1-800-959-8363 is the number to call. If you're a veteran, if you participated in World War II, especially the uh, uh, Pacific Theater, but but at any place during World War II, we'd like to hear from you. We'd like you to call us right now. We'd like to hear your story. So uh, why not go to the phones and call us? And if you're calling from inside the Baton Rouge area, the number is 767-4234. We're talking about the impending opening of the Pacific Theater wing of the National D-Day Museum in New Orleans, a remarkable museum. If you have not been, you really, really need to take the time to go to New Orleans and see this spectacular museum. And a good time to go would be December 7th, 8th, and 9th, because that's when this grand opening is. Uh, Jeff DeBlanc, who you just met in that video piece, has joined us on the panel. And uh, what a remarkable story. And, and I understand that we had to cut about 45 minutes out of your interview in order to fit it into this program tonight. That you, that you had quite a story to tell. Well, as we get older, it gets better. Oh, it does? <laughs> now, you had a remarkable story because you were shot down, and we kind of condensed it there, but you I spent see. a lot of time uh, kind of on the run, so to speak, did you not? That is correct. I uh, was a little apprehensive about my situation there because we weren't winning the war at that time, and... To be in enemy territory was something that uh, was I was concerned about. We have another word for apprehension in the Marine Corps, but I won't mention it. Oh, okay. <laughs> and, uh, the headhunters, I thought they were headhunters, and they were, picked me up. And I could see that uh, at 21 years of age, I uh, didn't know whether they were going to turn me over to the Japanese, which they were doing in those days, because... That your chances of survival were slim. Uh, we've had many pilots, and it, it cut the heads off of them mm -hmm. if they'd bail out out of Henderson Field. So they took me to another village, and they put me in a little bamboo cage. Now I'm not going to do any uh, Rambo type of thing. I've, I found out later from the Coast Watchers that they kept me there to prevent me from going out because if the Japanese flying over or would see the white man in the village, they would uh, strafe the village. Mm -hmm. In my idea, I could see myself in the pot, <laughs> and or else they were going to. So you were kind me. of a liability to the people. Uh, uh, who <laughs> I, I, I wish they'd let me go. Yeah. But anyhow, make a long story short, <clears throat> they um, they let me. They opened up the cage out there when another group of men, native islanders, came in, and one young feller, I'll never forget his name, and I had the chance of closing circle with him. He came up with a. 10 pound sack of rice and threw it at my feet and they let me go. Now I say to you and to anyone else that you cannot price out in dollars and pennies your exact worth, but I know exactly how much I'm worth. And it, 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 it kind of shakes you up. You're worth 10 pounds of rice. That is correct. As I get older, it's 100 pounds of rice. <laughs> but uh, seriously speaking, it's, it, it's a very uh, traumatic experience. And you were 21 years old. That is correct. You are just a child. <laughs> we were all college kids. And 80% yeah. of the fighter squadrons were college kids. We were, uh, we were, had, they rushed us through flight training under the CPT program right when the war broke out in Europe. And we had a sort of a fringe benefit. We got in on the first and the last. I don't know if that's good or not. <laughs> but well, listen, we've got some other folks here, and I'd like to, I'd like to introduce the rest of our panel to, uh, to our, our viewers right now. And uh, let's start down here. This is uh, Robert Bourgeois. And, Mr. Bourgeois, you were in Doolittle's Raiders, is that correct? That's right. You were part of that. I was one of the volunteers, the only one from Louisiana. And so you flew over and bombed Japan. Uh, my target was the Yokosuka Naval Base, the biggest one on Tokyo Bay. I was on crew number 13, and my crew outlived all the rest of the crews. My goodness. The, some of them went and bombed in Europe later, and three of our men uh, were prisoners of the Germans, and uh, some of the men from the Doolittle Raid, they captured two crews, Three of the men they executed, one of them died of malnutrition in the Bridge House prison, 
and the others, the other four men stayed for 40 months in solitary confinement. Couldn't agree. They went from 215 pounds, 200 pound men, to about 60 pounds. We had one of our boys that got a hold of a Bible and memorized it. And he went back to the Japan and became a missionary. My goodness. He married his wife in missionary school in Washington. And 500 of his parishioners in Tokyo were his prison guards. Wow. What a remarkable story. Now, it must have been something to be a part of Doolittle's Raiders because we know so much about that historically. And it was also kind of a, a special kind of thing because uh, there was a little bit of revenge involved in what Doolittle's Raiders was doing. Is that correct? Well, we all had volunteers, and I'd, I'd like to mention it. We didn't have any news people that were hanging <laughs> to get on the airplanes. <laughs> they all thought it was a one-way ticket. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Oh, Bourgeois. Great. Also joining us, uh, and, and uh, I, I'm really interested in hearing your story, is Anel Bulichak, who is a WASP. Yes, Women's Air Force Service Pilot. And that's, uh, a lot of people don't realize that there were a lot of women who were flying airplanes during World War II. What were you doing? I was towing targets <clears throat> for air-to-air -air combat training. And... Uh, Wait a minute, they were shooting at things right behind you? Yeah, the yeah we told the targets for the air-to-air -air combat training that uh, after the pilots graduated, they came back for, you were talking about you had gunnery school too, but this was Navy gunnery school. We were, uh, of course, none of us were on the front lines, let's just put it that way, but we released a heck of a lot of men who went on to the flight line. At the beginning of the war, we had more airplanes, because we'd been building for the British, than we had pilots, and there was a pilot shortage. So Jacqueline Cochran and uh, Eleanor Roosevelt was talking to her husband about this, the fact that there were women with private and commercial licenses who were capable of flying these aircraft, but they had, we had to go through the same training the men did, the primary, basic, and advanced, and they tried to get rid of us as hard as they could. But the ones of us that made it through, there were 1,074 of us that graduated, and 980 some odd of us ended up in service to the end of our, when they were, we did commission. But the funny part of our story is that we were neither fish nor fowl. We were supposed to be commissioned, and General Hap Arnold pinned my wings on me, so I know that I was officially he was a part the man of the Air Force. In the Air Corps. Yes. But uh, they, <clears throat> just never quite got around to doing it. I went to advanced officers training school in Orlando, Florida, but uh, then they started having not the casualties they thought they'd have overseas, and the men started coming back, so uh, <clears throat> they just abruptly disbanded us in December of 94. It said, go home. But uh, remember now, we were subject to court-martial. We were, all duties had to be performed, orders and lived in officer's barracks, ate in the officer's mess, officer's club. Uh, but um, 38 of us were killed in service, which My is goodness. the same amount that would be killed, they said, or less than men doing similar duties. And if you were killed in service, your parents either had to send for the body or we'd take up a collection and send the girls' bodies home. And uh, they paid us $150 a month, no flight pay. We were delighted. We were so thrilled to fly those beautiful airplanes, we didn't know what to do. But the only time we got mad was 36 years later, they took the first woman into the Air Force Academy, and they said, first woman to fly military aircraft. And we said, wait a minute. And Mary Goldwater, who was senator from Arizona, as you know, got up in front of Congress and said, what about the 60 million miles that those girls flew in World War II? And they flew every ship in the Air Corps' inventory, from the Stearman to the P-51 to the B-29. Uh, those were not military aircraft. So 36 years later, we get our official discharge, honorable discharges, and we are now veterans. Well, we're veterans. glad. And we're, uh, we're, and, we're, and we're happy that you can be with us this evening I, to tell us all that. my story. <laughs> <laughs> right. Okay. Now, uh, let's, let's move on. Let's see. Where are we now? We are with Wilbur Rogers, correct? Right. And you were uh, in the Navy. Right. And where were you? 
Well, I probably shot at that sleeve she was oh, toying. Oh, you were shooting at her target? Yeah, certainly. I, I was on a destroyer in World War II, and uh, I guess uh, my most uh, notable battle was Okinawa. And uh, they built 15 radar picket stations around Okinawa to protect the island. They put three destroyers on each picket station. And uh, they sent 98 destroyers up there. And of the 98 destroyers they sent up there, 80 of them were hit. Okinawa was a, a bloodbath for the Navy. One seventh of all the casualties suffered by the Navy in World War II was in Okinawa. And after 82 days up there, and the battle lasted 82 days, they finally secured Okinawa. And during that period of time, the Japanese threw over 2,000 suicide planes at the group. And of course, they found the destroyers out on the picket lines surrounding the island before they got to the invasion group. They thought they were easy picking. They were so easy in the picking that finally they assigned to us LCMs to follow us around. We referred to them as pallbearers mm. because their job was to pick up survivors. Yeah. Yeah. Remarkable. And also on the end, uh, Nolan Marshall? Right. And you were in the Marine Corps? Yes. And tell us where you were. All over the Pacific. <laughs> <laughs> we started in New, Mid New Caledonia to, um, to Guadalcanal, to Saipan, to Guam, to Tinian, to Beniki, and ended up in uh, the invasion of Peleliu. And you know, this is a small world. I met Wilbur tonight for the first time, and we mentioned the same questions that you asked me. Uh, and where was I? And I told him where. He says, well, this is a small world. We took so many of the big guns off of the battleship, off of the destroyer that I was on to put how many tons of? 40 tons. 40 tons of medical supplies to bring to us on Peleliu. Wow. And so few people know about Peleliu, but it was one of the bloodiest battles in the Pacific. And uh, we were there from D-Day on, from second wave in. It was really a tremendous Lefort Island. And how, how long did the battle last? Uh, we took it in about two weeks. Two weeks? Yeah. But uh, it was such a small island. It was uh, three and a half miles wide, five miles long. 15 square miles, but they must have had thousands and thousands of Japanese that were dug into the mountains there. Mm. There were none on the outside, on the, but all of them were dug in several different decks, heights of mountains, air caves in the mountains. And they were all there, and it was really tremendously hard to uh, get them out of there. I notice you have here a flamethrower. That was one of the best weapons that we had in there in securing that island. It was tremendously helpful to us. And that was it for was getting into the holes in the caves and the in the caves and, the and sealing plenty of the, the caves, etc. Yeah. It really it really was a hard fought uh, I think the first Marine Division which I was attached to at the time and my company was a smaller company called Eleventh Marine Depot Company. But we received citations from the Commandant of the Marine Corps for being attached to the 1st Marine Division at that time. So we were quite honored to have been in the actual invasion of that particular island and helped secure it. Well, we're so glad you could be with us this evening to tell us your story and all of you. Thank you very, very much. You. We're very honored tonight because we have a very special sneak preview, a look at a, at a special DreamWorks film that's uh, being produced by Steven Spielberg. And we've got kind of a first cut of it. And, and when you see it, you'll notice that it's a little rough. It has some numbers down at the bottom, which is called time code for editing purposes. But we thought we'd, we'd like to share at least a little part of it with you. Let's take a look. There were over 100 D-Days in the Pacific, on big islands, on small islands. But always the objective was to begin the process of taking that island. As we approached the beach, I could feel a real tenseness in everyone aboard that craft. It was complete quiet. While you're going toward the beach, you're doing an awful lot of praying. And some of the guys got a little sick. I watched the guys around me. They were scared. I was scared. I don't think we had any reason to be otherwise. You don't know what's waiting for you. 
Well, they could wait until you got on the beach and cut loose on you, or they could start firing right away, or anything like that, you don't know. When we were getting close to the beach, then you begin to feel, my God, this is real. And then as soon as they drop that ramp and you're exposed, you feel like you're the nakedest person in the world. And you knew darn well that they're going to start to shoot, which they did. We need, we need somebody. We need, we need the next person. All right. Uh, welcome back. Are we back? I think we're back. I see pictures on the screen, so. <laughs> All right. We have a special phone number that you can call, 1-800-959-8363. If you have a story to tell, you'd like to know more about the opening of the Pacific Wing, uh, if you'd like to find out more information about how you can be a part of this special celebration, why not call that number right now? And in the Baton Rouge area, you can call 767-4234. You know, I said this the last time, and the show was a lot longer. <laughs> we didn't have enough time then. And to try to do all of this in an hour is just next to impossible. So many stories to be told. Uh, and each one of these stories is just remarkable when you start hearing all the things, like the wasp pilot and, and, and how the war for her lasted much longer than just those few years, uh, in a sense kind of went on for many, many years after that. What, That's what, what the museum's about, telling this story. Yeah. Telling the story of so many wonderful people, not only on the fronts, but at home and what was going on here while they were out there, the support of the American people. And you know, Bob, today we feel that same patriotism surfacing. You know, we, we had worried a little bit about the timing now with what happened on September 11th, but I have to tell you that when you see what happened in World War II and how this nation came together and everyone united for a common cause and a common goal. We see the same sort of things happening today. First thing I did when all of this happened was I called my mom and I said, what was it like, you know, at, at Pearl Harbor? You know, what were you thinking? How did it impact you? And I think a lot of people are doing that here. Oh, absolutely. All across this country. And it is a, a difficult time for us all. And when you are faced with a challenge like this, you are called upon to think about the values that you uh, have and the understanding and the wisdom that you get from studying World War II. Yeah. Dr. Mueller, with just a few seconds left. Well, I just want to say that uh, and I think the Spielberg film, which is going to be a magnificent documentary uh, premiering at the opening of the museum, but it's about the heroes, it's about the citizen soldiers. And we want to also say that uh, this is a good time again to mention uh, the bricks that uh, people can uh, purchase to honor their heroes, uh, honor the veterans, or honor a loved one. And uh, those, uh, uh, there's a, a framed... Uh, you know uh, what? Uh, I hate to tell you this, but we're out of time. Done. But I, I thank you guys so much. It's been okay. a wonderful show. And we want to mention, if you want to continue to call, you can call the Museum Direct. There's another 800 number. We want to give it to you right now if you want more information after this program. Mm -hmm. That's one 800 273 Four four six three one eight hundred two seven three four four six three. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. We thank all our panelists and all the wonderful stories we heard this evening. Don't forget that opening is uh, is coming up December seventh, eighth, and ninth. Good evening. <laughs>
please send check or money order to the address on your screen or call 1-800-973-7246 and have your credit card ready. Visa and MasterCard are accepted. For each donation, LPD will contribute $2 to the United Way September 11th Fund. <laughs> 